Oh, I am in the video. Yeah, there's been a lot of videos I wanted to make. There's little comments here and there and stuff, but just haven't done it. And uh, it's probably not important, and so it's probably one of the reasons not to do it. But anyway, so uh, so anyway, there's a lot of people talking about red, you know, black pills, red pills, blue pills. Um, you know, and they're doing this somehow this metaphor from the Matrix that doesn't really make any sense anyway because the the Matrix was such a fake uh, duality, you know, between reality, you know, the real life and the fake life because the fake life was shit where the fake life could be not shit and then it would be a real contest and even when it's even when the fake life isn't not shit obviously the real life was shittier <laughs> so in every respect there was nothing appealing about it i'm um, e even if they even if you weren't in the war and you just lived in the underground hovel um you know having dance night or whatever uh it was still a pretty grisly place to live so um yeah uh but anyway so yeah i i certainly wouldn't be one to say be a fanatic about red pilling you know but anyway, they use this as a metaphor for like you don't know the real truth, you don't really the real world, and that comes up in this whole context of a Hitler movie, which makes it all even funnier, um, or weirdest, or strange. You know, it's, I guess there's a movie called the the documentary, the the greatest story never told, um, and some asshole asks, uh, "Isn't Mendham red pilled?" Um, you know, as if. Uh, it's six hours long, so I haven't watched all of it yet. It's very well made. Very, it's very, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, but it's just kind of funny to, to just yes. Oh, let's look at the world from Hitler's point of view. Um, but I suppose it's a fair enough thing to do. You should, you should, everybody should look at everything from everyone's point of view if they have the time. Um, seems only fair, uh, in a way, is to you know do as much as you can with your imagination in terms of getting that. The interesting thing is this, uh, this Robin Evans guy is arguing with these guys over communism versus um, national socialism, I guess, um, versus a kind of capitalism, really, right? Um, and, um, you know, the Robin guy makes a lot of good arguments in defense of communism, which is kind of funny. Um, you know, um, He's good, good. I mean, he has lots of documentation, lots of stuff um, to defend um, even, you know, the bad guys, uh, you know, Stalin and stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, so from that point of view, you know, so from particular points of view and by certain statistics, um, you can, you know, measure value. Um, but, you know, the, the lesson I take away from most of it is it's just the idea of just, you know, we've never tested any kind of civilization because we've never lived in times where um, you weren't wasting you know men or money um, in some insane way and that seems like that's all there is <coughs> is just you know and I, I, you know I, I've also made the argument that capitalism would be pretty benign um, as a economic system if you just took away the inheritance part the inheritance is what makes it all bad <laughs> you know it's it's like monarchy would be just fine if they couldn't inherit it you know you had to earn it um and yeah it's like it's just that's the way it is it just you know to, to me that's the instant fix for greed and selfishness is yeah just don't make it so it's inheritable could be a new post i haven't heard one of those in a while uh anyway so, I mean, it's probably nonsense, no doubt. Uh, so anyway, that's just a whole bunch of comments. I just thought some of that would be worth going through, but I probably should watch the whole documentary first. Um, you know, there's some stuff you learned that you didn't know. I mean, but, you know, generally speaking, it's, it's uh, just a way of presenting it, I guess. Uh, you know, it hasn't gotten to the whole final solution part. I don't know if you can really fix that anyway. Um, you can you know... I've said it before. I mean, I, you know, Nazis were fairly efficient at creating, you know, clean, motivated people, which is a good thing. Um, you know, and a lot of so there's a lot of good to it. But I mean, burning books and 
overt and disgusting bigotry just don't work. I mean, that's just too fucking stupid. So if you have to burn books and pointlessly hate people for the genetics of their blood, uh, yeah, sorry. I <laughs> just can't win with that. Um, so, but anyway, I, but I do better understand why the pe you know, I, I never really quite understood why people found Hitler charming because, you know, he just doesn't seem very compelling. Uh, but thinking about it in the context of the, the, the horrible depression after World War One and how bad things really were, um, you know, yeah, you can start to understand somebody saved you from that and also just sort of made everything happen. You know, all kinds of good things happen. <laughs> you know, I guess as you could see it. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> that's a whole separate subject. And like I said, I don't want to... It's just such a dangerous subject, you know, that, oof, who wants to get into that mess? And then the whole Stalin thing is just another dangerous subject because, uh, you know, people just don't care to think that it's... It's just that, you know, everything has to be turned into all capitalists are bad and all commies are bad. And, you know, from the two opposite perspectives, it has to be this all thing. And I don't think it's as bad as, like... Muslims. <laughs> yeah, Muslims are worse than both communism and capitalism. Um, you know, so that's what we should all agree on. Muslims are worse. A lot worse. Um, so anyway, so but there's this other stuff. You know, a couple of assholes always, always now and then somebody has to make a comment on the circumcision subject, and they're just so fucking fanatical. Um, you know, this whole idea that male circumcision, foreskin, is the, it's the same exact thing as female mutilation. Same thing, identical. It's like, you know, they don't even realize that you know, the anatomy is not in any way comparable, but eh, who cares? Uh, truth smooth. So anyway, it's all kind of interesting stuff. I guess maybe I'll read one of these comments from this yeah, asshole called Common Sense, 1776. You know, just that by itself, the whole American Revolution is another red pill kind of subject. You know, it's, what's the truth of our revolution? You know, really, wasn't it really just a bunch of um, um, noble types um, who uh, were sick of the king getting all the money? They just wanted the money. They wanted to own the country. And they suckered a bunch of, uh, you know, <laughs> commoners, uh, you know, into dying for the cause of making them rich. So anyway, so he says, uh, it's got a time code in it, which, you know, again, I, I wish people would understand, but using time codes is a nice idea if somebody wants to hear the whole context, but it would be a lot better if you actually quoted, you know, because I just, you know, really just seems kind of stupid to me without any kind of quote, any kind of context, to expect people to go jumping around because you think there's something relevant, you have relevant to say to it, you have your quote to make it, yet you're going to quote a time code, it's just, uh, so yeah, like you, Gary, so apparently it was something like, I said something like, somebody else is unproductive or some other kind of thing like that, and then he says, yeah, like you, Gary, see, see without the quote, it's just really pointless. Um, you got into your shithole position by circumstances, and you've probably accomplished little by personal effort. You know, the whole idea of personal effort is, uh, you know, <laughs> some people have to work just to wake up every day and, and get anything at all done, and so we're all fighting different demons, we're all stuck in different kinds of glue, and so all of that doesn't mean much as a, you know, you're whatever your argument is. I mean, clearly, I'm not arguing that. I'm just arguing that there is clearly a difference between being somebody who's... Uh, there's both the... the um, what you intend to do, and then there's your capacity to do it. And clearly, I'm going to argue that we can identify people's intentions, uh, whether they intend to contribute anything, and whether they actually do. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's a fair thing to do. Anyway, uh, you only exist to espouse your bullshit and yell at others in your hovel. 
So again, whether I'm in a hovel or not, does that make a difference? No. Whether my espoused bullshit is bullshit, again, is just your opinion. Who cares? I Sure, I think everything you believe is bullshit, too, so not very insightful. Doesn't mean much as an argument, your subjective opinion, based on no evidence. All right, anyway, no, no reasoning, anyway. The idea that you can criticize other people who are more productive than you, I don't know where I did that, um, just by having a job is astounding. Um, so I don't even, like I said, can't even make, can't even make sense out of that. But criticisms that are either valid or invalid. Now, again, you're going to judge messengers based on, instead of judging the criticism itself. So, and I think that's just, again, bullshit. It really doesn't matter. I don't have to be a vegetarian to point out, hey, it's wrong to harm animals and eat meat. I really don't. <laughs> it's an argument. You're supposed to judge the argument, not the person making the argument. But see, it's the people who aren't, <clears throat> who can't win a fair fight, who have to cheat, okay, <laughs> by distracting and changing the subject to the messenger. Not about the messenger. All right. Uh, you think you're superior because you figure out how your principled life purpose are equivalent. So again, I, I, I no, no, where, nowhere have I commented that I'm superior. I merely argue that if you think you want to live a life that's at all admirable in the end, you know, by by somebody other than Homer Simpson's judgment, um, then it's going to have to have this element of purpose in it, in terms of social, um, you have to leave the condo better than you got it. And if you're leaving it less than you got it, okay, uh, yeah, you weren't a great human being. <laughs> you were a lot less than that. That's just, uh, I'm just saying, I think that's a fact. Now, you don't think that's a fact. You don't think you have to earn, you don't have to defend your life. You don't think you have to. You don't have to uh, be minimally efficient. Or you don't have to be sufficiently efficient, as my bullshit philosophy says. So you think the idea of sufficient efficiency, uh, having that standard somewhere, that there's a line, whether you like it or not, uh, you think that's bullshit. Well, I think it's retarded, okay, philosophically retarded, not to understand this is a value game. That's what we're playing. It's a value game. Um, there's, it's, it's like gambling in Las Vegas. Um, show me the money. It's about the money. Okay, you, there's winners and losers, and they're, it's easy to figure out which ones are which. And the same thing is actually true about our lives. There's givers and takers. And it's really not that difficult to figure out who's who. So, fuck you, Yui. Um, but, <clears throat> it's living in shit land, doing shit all, going at people who are doing more, but don't have the same principles. Good luck with that. Yes, I, I think it's really easy to say, <laughs> to say um, like even on any principle, first do no harm, or that yes, I can demonstrate a comparison and say yes, you're, it's, it's quite easy for us to do no harm. We really don't have to. Uh, most of the harm we do is, is for the aggressive end of the greed and uh, the rest of it. Um, you don't have to be an asshole, as big an asshole, let's put it that way. There's not, it's really easy to shave um, buckets full of asshole off of your profile. Um, without giving up anything really meaningful. Um, anyway, good luck with that. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I think I've been fairly lucky with it. <laughs> but whatever. Um, you know, I, I could just point to somebody who says, look, hey, thank you, Gary. You, you helped me see that there was a lot more to having kids than I thought there was. And uh, so, you know, you spared some victim. It's not anything like that. So I could just point to one of those and say, yeah, I win, you know. I prevented another uh, victim being strapped to the gurney for no good reason. So asshole mangalas like you could, you know, cut them up a bit for your purposes. Um, anyway, also despite his anti-sex attitude, so this was, uh, I don't know who this was to. I don't know what the anti-sex attitude thinks about. 
I would say to Gary that non-procreative procreational sex is justified. I don't know why you'd say that to me. Like, why would I think non-procreative sex wasn't justified, you crazy person? To relieve tension in this shitty world um, by that argument. My, my argument, I guess, to Snake Pliskiness, which this video I don't think is too. Uh, no, it isn't. It's in the comments or video of some kind. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Where would you get the idea? The only the only sex I was saying, you know, that people have to take responsibility for is when they're involving somebody else in their sex, and they're playing them. You know, they're just using them. That um, that's unkind. Uh, even if it's doing something menial like chasing pussy. So again, if you're doing that dishonestly then I'm going to sit there and say, you suck. You know, if you're using other people's emotions and investing their destiny in your bullshit, then I'd say it's rational to critique that and say, gee, that's not a nice person. Um, a romance would always be better, but people can't always attain that. So again, I don't know where there's any... Where could this idiot construe that I've made a video, <laughs> you know, arguing against some, it's all a head game, asshole. I mean, your gratification is right there to grab if you want it. Um, by imagination alone. You just, you don't need any other tools. Everything is an interpretation of reality. It's not reality that you feel. You feel your interpretation of it. And, you know, that's all there is, is your own bullshit. So if you want to be happy, if you think happy is the important thing, um, it's not that easy to press the red pill version of it. So anyway, fuck you. Delete that one. That's just crap. Comments that I actually read, I think I have a right to delete just because I don't want to type responses to them. Fuck these assholes. Uh, they make these claims that I say something I didn't say. So anyway, the real reason I wanted to make this video, well, the real purpose of it, or anyway, well, the thing I wanted to get out of the way, there was a guy who posted a link to some other guy's videos. Uh, this guy, in the dark. Seems an interesting enough character, except you see him in a video here with a baby. And it's, it's, ooh, it's really, ew, creepy. Um, but anyway, yeah, this, this, this sort of reminds me of... Um, uh, Carney Zazul, you know, a little bit. Um, Charney. <laughs> you know, and um, just in the way he looks. I mean, the way he's, you know, he's got kind of a little bit of an accent, a little bit, but whatever. Um, so, so they were ragging on me somewhere in the comments here, I think, which, you know, isn't unusual. Um, I thought I saw it somewhere. It was in here somewhere, but anyway. Uh, oh, someone's quoting the Bible, John Yin. So these are some of my, I, I, it's weird when I, I see some of my people, <laughs> you know, hanging out in these other places. I say, yeah, gee, what an asshole. Um, so this is from the Bible. There is no fear in love, but perfect love chasteth, chaseth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Oh, John. Yeah, John's an asshole. Um, anyway. Um, fear is the only rational response to the circumstance we're in, frankly. I mean, the fact that we're all not hysterically upset is just evidence of our low character. So, that's Gary117. Um, thou is clueless to the um, blindness of the gliboscracy. <laughs> you know, you're all so fucking glib. Uh, that's the nature of, that's one of our worst, our most vicious tools, our, the biggest, sharpest, nastiest teeth, the worst venom we have is our capacity to be glib fuckers. Yeah. So anyway, you guys all this support me on Patreon stuff and whatever, but whatever, who cares? Uh, so I'll actually try to show some of the video, but it's really dark. But anyway, so he's being philosophical, philosoph 
it's philosophizable. And um, so talking about what it is to be alive somehow in here somewhere. So anyway, I, I've had, you know, I've uh, put this off for a couple of weeks. I've had this video loaded and I just never finish it. But anyway, so it's two minutes in when you're starting to get to something like, okay, I, I'm alive and I have this subject of experience, something like that. And then he's going to say something profound about that, I suppose. But we'll find out. What value you can get from looking at things objectively and scientifically and rationally and all this sort of stuff. That's, I'm not discrediting those things. But when I think... But... You know, that's always the key thing, right? I'm not discrediting rationality and pointing out how we're all caught up in silly ego games that makes us do silly, stupid, fucktarded things. Like, you know, strap another victim, you know, in the rickety roller coaster of any fucking thing could happen. <sighs> but whatever. About psychology, I like to start from the ground up. And I mean, like, really, the ground up, what we're actually dealing with. Like, what's my subjective experience of the world? What is it to be a human being? I'm not really concerned about, you know, what is addiction, what is depression, and what are the biological components of X. Uh, <clears throat> well, again, you know, you can't really say what it is to be a human being without recognizing the context of your creation as an animal, and clearly the functions, you know, the the biological reflexive mechanisms and then recognizing that some of those reflexes are you know two million years old and we're a little smarter than we were two million years ago so maybe we can do a little better than that um, I'm much more concerned about what is it to be human right and the first place that I start is to say okay well I have a subjective experience of being an individual in the world so I feel a sense of self and I'm in a place okay there's a self there's a center and there's a place and you know God knows what I'm doing here God knows how I got it well see that's the whole thing we do know so so he goes you know it just again is this you know overemphasize the visceral you know the loud noise and just don't pay attention to the symphony that's, you know, just around the corner. You know, just, oh, you go over there, look, see. You know, you're, you're, you're doing the shock and awe thing. So you're just saying, let's just do the shock and awe thing. And we won't pay any attention to the crap that's really important. You know, the, all the living things in the forest. You just see the trees, right? Da, 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 da. Come on, freaking computer. Hey. And God knows what the purpose of it is, but there's a space. Now, most of the space that I'm in is chaos. I don't have an understanding. I don't have a solid grasp, a reliable grasp of what is beyond my kind of conceptual boundaries of what exists in my immediate environment. Again, it's just silly, right? I mean, through our whole life we ask these questions. Why this? Why there's God? This? That? We're, you know, these are ponderables that you do throughout your life and if okay maybe you don't think there's answers to those questions in the sense that the they're they're not complete enough we don't have a we don't get to see exactly why universe happened or something but um clearly you can understand the, the, the there's there's more than just your snowflake on the snowball and that you're kind of oblivious to the hill you know the snowball's going down i mean no, we see a lot. We can see a lot, a lot more than what's happening in our little trivial uh, personal lives. So we're very limited in the sense of yeah, exactly the opposite. Infinite. It's exactly the opposite. We're not very limited. We're very capable. That's the whole point of us being separate from all the poor animals that are just trapped in that Borg of um, feelings and having to be completely owned by them where we can step right over them and say oh I don't like that but I know not to judge things by the cover you know I know the book might be better than the ugly cover that kind of thing we can do all of that stuff infinity out there essentially there may as well be infinity out there you know there's incomprehensible amounts of information that you 
can learn and there's there's a million and one things that you can find out about there's a billion things that you can do there's right just, so, so, a, so so it's a huge contradiction you're just you know one minute you say we can't do that and the next minute you're, you're conceding that you could spend a whole you could spend many lifetimes um uh, gathering data about function uh, you know about the the mechanisms that compel uh you know studying psychology for example or studying evolution are studying even the physics so you know there's there's a ton of context to everything we every blink of your eyes so to speak you can analyze the blinking of your own eyes see an absolute ocean of chaos out there and again the chaos so you know because what, what what do you think's chaotic uh leaves turning brown and falling off of trees uh changing seasons uh the moon going around the earth or something what what do you think is chaotic i mean clearly there is a <clears throat> um you know when we were less uh, intelligent you know people thought uh, you know the sun revolved around the earth they had a misimpression um now, I don't know if it's significantly better or improved information. I mean, I don't know whether it really matters where you think one way or you think the other because nothing's really at stake. But simple things like understanding the difference between, you know, the fact that uh, you think, a, I guess people think carrots feel or parameciums or some other, you know, they think that, it, that, that what we're doing is the same thing as what they're doing because they look like now and then. They can do something reactive, and then we say, "Oh, that's just like what we're doing." And then the opposite, other extreme is people can see, uh, you know, a dog dreaming while sleeping and having an obviously having a dream, and they can say, "Oh, those dumb animals don't matter. What they feel doesn't have any importance. My feelings matter. How comfortable I am matters. But I could tear its legs off, and it doesn't matter. And I could have it for dinner. It doesn't matter." Uh, but you're saying we don't have answers? Oh, sure we do. And that is basically what this kind of meta space that we're in is. It's this sort of fluctuating sea of chaos. And you see that just from the, the cycle of the days, the cycle of the years, the cycle of just reality. Just, just. I can't. Totally opposite impression. Uh, you know, so yeah, I can't. Yeah, where do you get that from? Chaos how? It's all these reliable mechanisms. Even even the like, even the worst part. I mean, war, um, fathom, uh, fathom, fathom, fathom. <laughs> yeah, that too. Uh, you know, a rainstorm. I mean, it's all kind of reliable. It just keeps you know it keeps just banging us on the head over and over and over again. We keep banging into the same crap. It's the same bag of potatoes, just, you know, rinse and repeat. Come on. Chaos? Look at the seasons, look at everything. It just, it's a constant flux. It's this constant, like, pumping. It's like, just like your heart, just like everything. It's this cyclical flux. And yeah, God knows so, what that so, means. Right, so that you call chaos. The, the reliability of the heartbeat, you know, is chaos. That's exactly the opposite. It's this thing tested over, um, you know, whatever, 300, 400 billion years, 500 billion years of, of, of testing to build one that just is quite reliable and quite dependable and works quite well. And you're calling it chaos. Now I'm supposed to understand that? No. No, but I just, I just observe that I am a self and I have all... I have a subjective experience of being a self in a place that I don't have full comprehension of. Now, how do we analyze the environment? Yeah, right. Full comprehension isn't, you know, who cares? Because every detail isn't really important. I mean, you don't have to count all the hairs on the top of your foot uh, to say, oh, I, I'm, I don't know exactly how many hairs are on the top of your foot, so therefore I am totally ignorant of what life is on Earth. But, you know, so, I mean, clearly, in my opinion, um, the information, the need to know stuff is accessible. It's right in your face, okay? Dog, pig, equal sign, 
substantially not hard to do uh, don't harm dog torture kill pig no good reason except my subjective experience says I want to yum yum bacon yum yum and that's as good as you can do and you're going to talk about you're doing philosophy Yeesh. we're in what what are the ways that we perceive what are the lenses that we look at our environment through well the first the most primary basic important foundational uh, i don't know how many other words i can use for that but really really super important and foundational and basic um kind of psychological phenomena in this sense is hostility and friendliness we interpret the world in terms of what is well i mean it's almost a silly way to put things, right? I mean, yes, there's good and bad. Um, there's stuff that tastes good, stuff that tastes bad. There's comfortable, uncomfortable. Um, that, that you're just doing another way of describing the same thing, attraction and repulsion. And I guess I would argue that like in physics, <laughs> there's really no attraction. There's just push, there's just repulsions. And they can either and you know every pull is just some way of pushing in some different kind of way and every thing you want you want because you're being driven pushed not because it's pulled you hostile towards me and what is friendly towards me what is good for me and what's bad for me what's trying to help me stay alive basically and what's trying to kill me and you notice this with babies it's one of the first lenses that they put over the world if you put them with someone they don't trust yeah so it's like a lizard <clears throat> so you're just talking about lizard uh, mechanisms inside of us our visceral reflexes which obviously are totally get people into huge amounts of trouble <laughs> in terms of the <clears throat> um, you know, in the context of bigotries and other nonsense that is just demonstrated how corrosive it is to anything good ever happening. Um, so, yeah, we have to live a more... You can't, you can't live based on this silly aesthetics um, with, with subjective um, visceral aesthetics. is not going to... You're just a lizard then. You might as well just throw all those extra brain cells, just slice it off and, you know, put it in the microwave because you're done. It's hostile, hostile, like their alarm systems go off. They sense a kind of hostility in the other person and they don't trust it and they let you know. So one of the first lenses that a baby puts over their, their kind of perception of the world is this hostility and friendliness dynamic. If they hear a loud noise, it's bang, what was that, what was that? They know that there are hostile uh, entities and objects out in the world, and they know that there are friendly objects and entities like the mother and stuff that they will go towards when they feel threatened. So hostility and friendliness is the basis of just about everything. Now, think about... Uh, whatever. So, yeah, this is kind of a turn-off, right? I mean, philosophy through the eyes of... Uh, infant m maturation you know, is it's just so crude and the value can be gleaned out of it and the important part isn't so much what the baby's experiencing but how the environment has been molded to create um, a sense of what is trustable and in the sense that I think most people end up in some way or another the fucking assholes they become is because of that bad training those bad associations um, where you know they accept excuses and you know start thinking it's funny <laughs> you know it's funny watching the little critters die you know on the stove this if I was to just drop you in a completely alien environment that you didn't understand you've never been to before you had no comprehension of how the laws of physics work in this environment it's just baffling to you what would be one of your first impulses 
it would be okay I'm confused I'm disoriented what's going on you start to get a bit of a map of what's going on and it'd be right what is threatening me in here what in here might threaten me what what might be detrimental to my I uh, no, sorry you just don't do that much thinking you'll either feel comfortable or uncomfortable and then you'll start making associations between the whatever the, the conditions were that surrounded the comfortable feeling feeling whatever the conditions were surrounding the uncomfortable feeling and that's all you're going to feel you, you're going to feel sick or happy or something and it's going to be because something in the environment is causing that um, by your judgment you're not going to think of some internal problem you're having you're going to blame it on something external if you're a dumb baby I experience in this place you're looking for threats and second to that what is it in this environment that can help me help me to gain an understanding of that environment and what does it mean to gain an understanding of your environment it means to create order in your environment too that's that's what order is so out of all this chaos we're essentially putting down order in your yeah so again it's this control thing if i change the environment into what i need it to be then I'm, that's the truth, <laughs> you know, it's how does it serve me, not how do I serve what might be important elements in the environment. So again, it's just this whole me first thing is just ignorant. You know, the first thing you have to assess is am I stepping on something that goes ouch when they get stepped on? I just can't hear it. Are, are the hoo you know, in all the little dust balls? Do I have to be worried about something? But, you know, you're not even thinking about that. Environment. And that is, as far as I can tell, the reason we have this kind of compulsion to put down order into our environment and to create order in our environment is, to, is because we can detect... No, we're just making moats for the bad feelings. We're just creating, you know, we're, we're trying to fight the, the stuff that hurts us, that we've associated with harm, we've had bad experiences with and we're making moats and filling it with crocodiles and say crocodiles go eat the bad thing go kill the bad thing that's coming for me we're just creating our suits of armor um, you know and some weapons um, so we can uh, fight off something that's going to degrade our feelings take an arm off or something it's always a Life is trying, the, the, the real game from the subjective perspective is just one of trying to maintain what you have. Most people, I'd say, aren't trying to gain so much as they are trying to preserve. Hostility, much easier in when it's against the kind of back, background of order. If we see an entity or an object or something that is in the context of chaos, we don't have an understanding of it, we don't have a perception of it, we can't tell whether it's friendly or... So again, where, what's the context for that? I mean, when, you know, when the, you know, purple elephants um, come stomping on your front walk, uh, you know, you're, you're making a, a metaphor that I just can't relate to at all. What, what's this chaos that's coming for me? What, what, what part of existence is this thing that I can't understand that's that's coming for me. It seems like it's all quite labelable and categorable. You're going to put all kinds of shit in categories and label things and understand why they exist and why you're stuck in this fucking shithole. Is because, you know, people did shitty philosophy. Pretty much. Hostile. We can't tell what's going on. We, we're right on that until we find out what's going on. So this uh, capacity or this need or preference to create order seems to come out of a fear of hostility and a, a kind of um, preemptive uh, attack on hostility or a preemptive defense rather against hostility. Now when you consider your... So, you know, this is just kind of like you're talking about word games or semantics or something. I mean, this seems like a an awful strangled way of describing what the battle is. It's not, things don't have to be hostile to you in the sense that they're not doing anything wrong for you to find it obnoxious. Somebody can be playing music that they love and I hate. <laughs> you know, 
I don't really have a right to spear that. I don't have a right to, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, cut their brake cables, you know, so I don't have to listen to their music anymore because they don't have a right to like music. They have to like what I like. I mean, that stems from what you're claiming is some sort of logic, but it's obviously for anybody a little bit sophisticated, that's not logical. For experience of the world, like nature, being out, you know, outside and outdoors and stuff like that. Like, if you look at it now, it's like silent out here. Um, what's your experience of nature? Okay, because in in between friendliness and hostility, there's a kind of um, indifference, right? So is nature friendly to you, um, hostile to you, or indifferent? Well, it's a kind of a pointless thing to say, right? Because uh, obviously every... I mean, everybody experiences wonderful parts of nature, like naked girl in the warm sun and the friendly daisies. And, you know, well, nature's great. Um, mosquitoes, uh, smelly bogs with all kinds of flies and shit. I mean, just bears. You know, I have to worry about bears here. You know, it's a mixed experience. Just as our real life, natural life is a mixed experience. Some experiences are really pleasant and some natural experiences are really unpleasant. You, know, you can't just label the whole thing fun house. <laughs> you really can't. It, rationally. Different to you. Well, if I was to look at nature from here, it's kind of indifferent to me. There's ways that you can perceive nature as being hostile. Obviously, it's full of threats. And not only that, but nature is silent. Nature doesn't speak to you. I can't, if I scream out now for help from nature, it ignores me. So is that hostile? Like, you've got to think how, not how the world is, but how your brain is perceiving the world to be. Yes, well, again, I just, I, don't, I think your theory that people's brains are expecting, <laughs> you know, uh, nature to be a person and come to the rescue or there's somehow nature knows how to speak English or any of that crap I don't think most people waste too much neural energy on any expectations like that and it's the same with processing childhood trauma you've not got to think about how it actually was when you were a kid you've got to think about how you perceived it to be when you were a kid yes well that's the one so you got that one right. That's exactly right. It just doesn't matter whether, um, uh, let's see how to say this, your, your, your subjective experience, whether it's the thing's fault or not. Like you could, you could fall down and get a terrible bump on your head or something walking through the magic castle at Disneyland. And then the rest of the day you have a migraine headache. So Disneyland sucks because you had a migraine headache, not because Disneyland sucks. And so you end up going to associate your personal experience, which had nothing really to do with Disneyland, it had to do with the asshole who left the styrofoam cup on the ground or something. Uh, you know, yeah. So you end up with associations that are, um, uh, I, I'm not going to say inappropriate, but they're, 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 they're not mathematically um, precise in that the events aren't necessarily fairly judged by your subjective experiences. And then those things can be, you know, people can have lasting trauma from that bad one experience when it was a one in a million bad experience. <laughs> and if they had had a common experience, then they would be more normalized. Right, that's the space you've got to put yourself back in to grieve that, that trauma. And speaking of this, this kind of capacity to create order and stuff like this, this hostility and friendliness and uh, childhood trauma and stuff like that, well, what is childhood trauma and what's wrong with the world? Well, see, that's a good subject. I'm just saying the, the idea of what happens to us in terms of maturation and how it glibs us or how it um, paranoids us. So you could say, you know, I could argue there's, the, you know, there's these different emotional themes that people are living by. 
and um, you know, it, but it's get kind of complicated getting into all that. And the fact that there are there's people who are too sensitive, and then there's people who are way too insensitive. Um, that we can know for sure. Now, where the right amount of sensitivity is, that's the tricky one. And I'd almost argue the too sensitive ones. Maybe there's no. <laughs> maybe the truth is that we haven't even we haven't even realized the scale of where appropriate uh, trauma should be in the sense of in recognizing the scale of the Freddy's nightmare that we're part of. We think it's okay because it's psychedelic colors. You know, you could take the Freddy Nightmares movies and you could you could repixelate them, you know, change them visually. Um, you know, and without the context of the story and the rest of it, you could try to make that not horrible. This the stuff being portrayed, the the fear being exploited, and um, you know, you you could make it all kind of into pastel colors, and you could do certain things to trick yourself into thinking it's all okay. And that would I be, I would argue that's our psychosis is that we don't see things in their true uh, color, um, red. Childhood trauma is basically where your parents are hostile towards you, okay? But because you have to, as a child, you have to believe, you have to idealize your parents. You have to believe that your parents are friendly towards you and are good people. What happens when you idealize them if they are hostile towards you is not only that you confuse hostility for friendliness, right? But you don't actually have a sense of what friendliness is. And hostility and friendliness are just the kind of psychological phenomena. The best. Well, yeah, well, whatever. It's all kind of you know, baby talk or something. It just sounds a little silly <laughs> to talk about it in those terms. Um, but obviously, you can be, um, you can have a dualism. You can have a mixture of positive and negative experience that leaves you uncertain uh, you know, how to feel. Behavior that takes place. If you look at the emotions that are behind it, the emotions that produce that behavior, it's love and hate, right? People say that, that love and fear are the opposites and, and everything is about love and fear. No, fear is a mechanism that your brain has, has devised to protect you from hostility. Okay, to, to foresee hostility coming and avoid it. Right? So fear isn't the opposite of um, friendliness, which is love. You know, Fear isn't the opposite of love. Hate is the opposite of love. Well, whatever. Friendliness, love. Again, these are things of addiction, frankly. Um, most of the times I was in love, it was because it was feeding an addiction, of, of an addiction to aesthetics, uh, mostly. And... Um, um, you know, just not, not a really a, not a positive mechanism, addiction. So, again, it's a subject you don't want to talk about, but, you know, to me that's the more, that's the context of this subjective experience, is our subjective experience is polluted by these very negative um, biological and traditional addictions. It's always, it, I, I've never understood why people say, oh, fear and love. Of course, it's, it's love and hate. Love is, is being really, you know, intimate and really friendly towards someone, really caring about someone. Hate is the absolute opposite. It's really wanting to hurt someone. It's really fucking, you know, just hating someone. And I don't think that the problem with the world is necessarily an overabundance of hostility and hatred, right? Because that's how psychology normally sees things. It's like, <clears throat> well, I think it's kind of obvious that this, it is because of the very thing I was talking about, the fact that we are addicted and um, we have our own definitions of good music and pretty woman and blah, blah, blah. And that's how we get into all these conflicts with people viscerally is because their world is fatty land or something or their world is um, smelly or their world is some other thing that you're just, hey, I can't relate to you know, your world, and um, that just 
rolls into hostility because the we don't find each other's odors um, uh, tolerable. People are too bad. There's too much hatred. There's too much hostility. Let's try and fix that. I don't see it necessarily from that perspective. I think we're more than well versed in hostility and hatred. We've experienced more than enough of that as children and more than enough of that just as adults in the world. More, more than enough of that from nature. You know, you're, you're constantly subject to the, the laws of entropy and you're constantly getting sick and you're constantly falling over and, you know, cutting your hands and, and stuff. It's like nature is a bit of a prick to you. So I don't think it's like we don't have any comprehension of hostility and we don't understand uh, suffering and all this sort of stuff. I think we have a perfect understanding of Yeah, well, I guess, again, you know, I say, no, we have, it's far short because we're behaving like ignorant animals, as if we're like a crocodile and we can pretend we're ignorant. I didn't know that I was torturing the animal by sticking my teeth in it and then twisting it and turning it underwater and suffocating it and... I didn't know that was how unpleasant for the animal. <laughs> we don't have those arguments to make. Well, we're pretending we do. Well, I didn't know. Yeah, you did. You just didn't. You just said it's not convenient. It's an inconvenient truth, and that's got it got thrown in that bucket. Of all of these things, I think if you go deep enough, you you can really wrap your head around what's going on there. I think the problem is not that we don't understand hatred and hostility. We know that way too well. I think the problem is that we don't understand love. We don't understand what friendliness is. Because a lot of the time... Yeah, because a lot of the time it's just usury. It's just, I want, I take. And you find some, you know, bullshit. Roses and candy. You know, you find a bribery. Uh, some, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll go through the motions, you know, the payment to get what I want, you know. That's all it is. It's just purchase. And most of the time it's purchased through exploitation. We didn't get that as children. And that's really what processing your childhood trauma is about for a lot of people. You know, there are exceptions, of course, but for a lot of people it's just the realization that your parents didn't love you. It's that is of course it's that simple. Your parents just didn't love you. And and so much of that transformation of ideal You know, the truth was that your parents, okay, had an idea like puppy kitten thing and they didn't want to deal with I'm making a cat. You know, it's it's there's no you know, it's a little duck, you know, and they're just not thinking, Oh, I'm making a full grown duck that it will live in the world. There's no, there's no recognition of what the project was. The project was entertain me, give me something to motivate me and, and um, 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 involve me and you know, keep me unbored. Um, but that's all it is. It's a kind of... And, and then there's the whole ego part of it. You know, people had kids because they think they need to or grandma's begging for a grandchild to you know, whatever, pinch in the cheek or some bullshit. So there, oh, that's a good enough reason. Grandma needs to pinch something. <laughs> it's no, this is just completely irrational um, behavior, this farting out of conscious beings for your entertainment or to give grandmother something to pinch. It's silly. It, it's, um, there can't have been any thought that went into it. Because if you have any thought going into it, any sense of love is going to be destroyed by the terror that you're committed yourself to. The, in, the incredible um, weight of the responsibility you now have for all the harm that happens to that individual that you've put on this tightrope. You've shoved it on a tight rope, for fuck's sake. And how can you do that glibly and be rational? How can you just pretend that isn't a huge thing to do to something? To pluck it out of the ether and put it on the tight rope? I mean, that's a hell of a fucking thing to do. And, you know, 
you're telling me there's some way to be rationally glib or to have some friendly feeling <laughs> you know about the realization that you're now responsible for its capacity to stay on that rope yeah. it's silly in your parents and move into a place of where you at least have a better understanding of what was really going on depending on you know wherever that leads you <clears throat> that transition yeah somewhere in the process your parents wake up to the fact that holy shit what have I stepped into and then you as the child end up feeling their discomfort and and the fact that they're kind of shutting themselves off from it um, because they need to they need to run away from that sense of responsibility and you can kind of see that in the sense of the you know parental detachment from their obligations to pay attention to what's happening to their kids is always one of saying hold on there was more hostility there than I realized and that hostility I had normalized as friendliness because I assumed it was friendliness it came from my parents I, I just you just make that assumption as it is and now my template for what is friendly is actually when when I really uncover it and when I really look at it is actually hostility yeah, I just think that's psychobabble, to tell you the truth. It might be true for some kind of psychotic killers or something where they've gotten it all backwards somehow and they're sadomasochists or something and they get off on violence and failure and pain and suffering and all that stuff and seeing it in others and imagining it happening to themselves or something. I don't know. But I just, you know, I think that's a brain way lost. It's not going to be, you're not going to educate it with a video. <laughs> so that's going to it's going to take, it's going to take a it's going to take a lot of retraining of the psychology to fix that one. And I think this is a large part of what picking up on red flags is. I was talking to uh, Blue the other day about red flags, and I think that's really what it is. Is you have this, you're in this meta space of chaos, right? You've created a certain amount of order. Okay, and you believe that the people that you've let into that space are friendly, right? They're part of that order. Because if you've established them as friendly, you can relax your defenses around them. So pretty much all of your brain is wrapped around this detection of threat and hostility. And there's another half of it that's wrapped around love and friendliness and, and sort of togetherness and all this. Yeah, well, whatever. I say most of that is bullshit. So again, you can say people have those motivations, but most of it's through some sort of usury. They give to gain um, something in the future. But it's all strings attached. There's all kinds of oblig uh, obligatory, um, you know, oh, go send her a fruitcake. You know, you get some thing on Christmas, you got too much of this and too much of that, and so you repackage the gifts and send them to somebody else as a sort of token of, yeah, well, maybe they'll, you know, when I need them, they'll show up. <laughs> it's just feeding dependencies and, and uh, fear. And so, you know, to call this friendliness, you know, the friendliness of being used by other people, <laughs> oh, gee, it's, uh, it's just such a warm, glowy feeling you can get about that. Cool stuff. So... What's happening when you're detecting red flags is you have this environment of order that you've created, right? And that's just really, in your mind, you have an understanding of that meta space, which really is never order or chaos. It's just this meta space. Yeah, well, that's not true either. So, I don't know, this just this meta space. Um, now, you're still sitting here with the uncertainty every day about what's going to go wrong and uh, how do I keep this boat ship shape enough to take the storms um, your understanding of that is that it's orderly that there's nothing there's no threat there okay and then when you when you get a red flag come up when someone says something that just irks part of you that just tweaks a little part of you and you say, wait a minute that wasn't that's not normal what that is is your threat detection parts of your brain the, the, the threat detection part of your mind locking on to something that. Yeah, well, that's a little bit A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, but anyway, probably enough, almost an hour or so. Well, it will be an hour but if, as I do my wrap-up here. So, sufficient. Um, uh, probably.
probably should listen to the rest if there's a punchline, but whatever. Um, so it's O G M Menzin. I don't know what that means, but whatever. And uh, nice enough fellow, but yeah, it says. Like I said, if, if, there's, if there's somewhere in this bullshit a rationalization for doing this stupid act, you know, creating another um, bomb ready to explode, you know, and think you're a competent, you know, bomb disposal guy or something. Oh, yeah, I'm going to push the right buttons on this thing. Good luck, asshole. Um, you're not going to get what you think you're going to get. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just... Odds are against it anyway, let's just put it that way. Very few parents get what they thought they were going to get. So anyway, until next time, and such, and so forth and whatnot.